Hello there, I'm Sandy Alnock. I'm an artist and in today's video I want to answer a question while I draw some poppies since it is Memorial Day weekend. Thank you to those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Lori has been messaging me on Instagram with questions about color. Specifically, she's struggling because she keeps trying to follow tutorials. She's taking one of my classes and she just can't get her color under control. She just feels like all of her color is muddy. And I totally get it. It's real easy to make mud, <laughs> much easier than it is to make good pure color. She's been trying conversion charts and things aren't working there. There's just all kinds of problems she's struggled with. And I want to say to her and to you, if you're struggling with color, you are not crazy. You're not a bad artist because of the struggle. We all go through it. So we're going to talk about why this happens, some strategies to adapt to it in a couple different mediums. And then before we get to the end, I want to make sure that you put your drink down because I'm going to introduce you to something very silly. Uh, my Fischenstein monster, aka Frankenfish, and I'll show you how I colored him. And I'm going to introduce you to the new class, Imaginary Creatures, which is just hilariously fun. So please don't snort anything out your nose, like your orange juice or your coffee. Okay. With so many reasons to address, let's start with the basics, which is brand. You don't have to use the highest quality, but that quality will make a difference. Not that you can't make amazing things with lesser supplies. Just remember you get what you pay for. And if you're trying to use a lesser brand to mimic a higher end material, you're just not going to get the same results. Some people will choose a student grade versus an artist grade material for financial reasons. Artist grade supplies are going to be manufactured with more care for light fastness, pigmentation, accuracy of color, performance, etc. So if the instructor shows higher quality art supplies than you have, that's obviously going to have an effect on your outcome. And with jumping from one brand to another, even if a color is named the same thing across brands, it doesn't mean it's going to do the same thing. Just because everybody uses the name Scarlet Red doesn't mean there's a global standard for Scarlet Red. Some are going to be brighter, some are going to be duller. And every manufacturer has their own process. Some have experienced color scientists on staff and others don't. And without a chemist on staff right there, it's easy for any manufacturer to get off track and create colors that might look good in a swatch, but they turn into mud when in actual use. Some products are manufactured to maintain their color for a long time, light fastness, and others will fade over time. And some are just mediums that change within minutes or hours. You've probably experienced that with watercolor. It dries about 30% lighter than it looked when it's wet and it can be surprising when you go back to look at your piece. Alcohol markers also can change when the paper is no longer soaked with the alcohol. And then when it's dried, it's going to change. In addition, if you hang your piece up and expose it to light, the colors are going to continue to lighten because alcohol marker is not light fast. Now let's talk a little bit about technique, because if your technique is to flow a lot of ink onto the fibers of the paper, get it really saturated, making a lot of small marks to fill an area, but the instructor is dancing their marker quickly across the surface, they're leaving less ink behind on the paper than you are, or vice versa. Or perhaps if your markers are really juicy and expelling a lot of pigment, or really dry, meaning a not, a, not a lot of color is going to end up on the paper, that could be very different because you can't tell whether or not the artist has a lot of ink in their pens, whether they're recently juiced up. In this example on screen, the Copic markers on the left tend to flow a little more slowly in putting the ink on the paper. Olo markers on the right flow more freely because of the way that their manufacturing system is. Both provide a different effect and some adjustment of your technique might be needed between the two. They're just different products even if they're both alcohol markers. In any medium, how you apply the tool is going to make a difference. 
whether it's a marker, a brush, or a pencil, and how the color flows from your hand versus the hand of the person who you're following. Maybe you're more heavy-handed with the tool, or they are more heavy-handed, or maybe you work slower or faster. And sometimes even that can dictate how much pigment is left on the paper's surface. When there's blending involved, you'll also have the difference between how much of the shadow, how much of the midtone, and how much of the highlight color are there, where they start and end, and how much of the colors overlap. There is no measurement in art like just put a teaspoon of this color here or three quick swooshes and one long dragged out mark that you can follow. Honestly, I can't replicate my own lessons exactly a second time. There's always going to be something different and that's okay. Now with colored pencil, there can be completely different factors like how much pressure is applied when you're drawing with the color. Is it consistent across the whole drawing or does it get heavier and lighter in different parts? Are you using blending solutions? Are you burnishing it somehow? Are you using other techniques that will alter or increase the coverage of the pigment? And are you drawing on top of pigment that has already been altered with a blending solution? And did the artist that you're following do that or did you decide you can achieve the same thing with your own favorite technique, but then it turned out it changed the, the hue of everything because of how you applied the color. And then there's the paper used. Colors look different on a paper that's bright white and bounces light off the surface, or if it's a slicker one, or if it's softer paper and the color sinks into it, or if it's a slightly different shade of white. That's why I always recommend swatching your colors on the paper you're going to use for your finished art. So your swatches are going to show you what's supposed to happen with the color when you get to that paper. The different tools used here for blending the colored pencil with the blending solution that's in that little cup will create different effects. The brush, the cotton ball, and the blending stump will lift or leave different amounts of pigment. And some of them with certain colors and certain brands can even change the hue, not just the value when you're doing your blending. And it's important to understand that you might have that change happen. Now, what is hue and value? Let's talk about that. Value is the amount of light and dark and the hue is the color itself. If you're to prize one over the other, prize value more. If you get your colors wrong, that's not going to matter as long as your darks and lights are in the right place. I could have done that poppy in blue and purple and it would have been fine if I had the darks and lights correct. Now this conversion chart, I included some colors that some people would be like, you're crazy. These two don't match. Well, guess what? Their hue is right. Their color is right. It's the value that's off. I could just take that B45 and do a couple layers of it and come up with come up with the exact same color as B4.6. With the BG09, I could just add some blue to it. So really my chart has hints at what you could try. You could go with just these colors, but you could try this and then add a little something something to it. But the something something depends on what you're creating and whether you need it to go more blue, more purple, more whatever. These V colors and the RV colors, there's not really great matches for a lot of them because Copic just doesn't have that kind of brightness to it. And then when you get into some other colors like these two YGs, the value is spot on between the two of them, but the color is very different. So you can use them in the same spot. Just know that you're going to get a little color shift because you're putting a more brownish green in there. Now say you're looking for a color that's going to match something in a tutorial and you don't have the color match that's listed here. Look on the rest of the sheet because there's other color ideas you can try. If you're looking for an orange and you don't have the orange that's listed to go, go with the tutorial, then pick a different one from the page. It's, these are like really great tools to have. And mine is free. There's not very many free conversion charts out there. I don't know why, but... Maybe it's a bad business model to give stuff away. I don't know. Well, the main difference that I see here between these two poppies, the Copic one looks a little more on a neutralized kind of color scheme and Olo is just more intense. Even the dark colors just have more punch to them. 
And that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you are. I like a more neutralized color scheme because I like to make things look realistic. You don't tend to see really punchy colors in real life. All right, this is the color swatches comparison that I did for the imaginary creatures class that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. The top rows, pretty much I found apples to apples. The purples and the pinks they kind of had more trouble just because of the intensity of the Olo colors. I found some of them that had really good matches, some of the pinkish kind of colors, but there's just some intensity in that, that violet range that just isn't working for me all the time. It'll work in the class just fine. The blue violets are really interesting to me just because of something I'm gonna show you. They play nicer with a color scheme that I'd like to be able to use more. This dark color, we're gonna to have to figure out how to make that FV2 turn into a dark color. And I'm gonna show you that. But for the most part, the colors are gonna work for the class. So you can take the class in whichever set of markers you want. These over here are the ones that I used for the poppies. And you can see the darks and the midtones are roughly the same. The, the midtone Olo is a little stronger and the pinks, there's a difference, but I'll show you how you can handle a difference in value like that. So let's get into compensating for those problems. Remembering that it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? Just deep breath, don't stress out if it's not absolutely perfect. But I have some ideas for you on how you can use your markers and your pencils to try to get a, a color that's gonna be closer to what you want, gain some control over your color. So let's look at those pinks. This is the Copic Pink R32, and it's matched in this particular case with R0.3 in the Olo. This is a value difference. Remember, this is just one that's darker than the other. And all I have to do is go over the Copic one again, and I end up with basically the same color. So just because something has a value difference, don't toss it out and say, I can't use that. Now, when you're talking about a blue-green color, let's do the same thing with the blue-green that's in this. The Olo blue-green is just a stronger color. I can then take the Copic and just go over top of it and, and intensify that color. Now let's look at that dark purple color because that's something that's gonna take a little more brain power. Just thinking through how you want to mix the color and what color you wanna push it toward. And the FV2 is a lovely purple, but it hasn't had friends to blend with. And now it's got this BV17 staring at it. So we have a value difference between the two but we don't have much of a color difference. So I can just add another color to it. In this case, I picked a B99, maybe a little bit too dark, but I can fix that by lightening it again with some FV2, because a lighter color in alcohol marker will kind of lift up some of the color that was already there. Got a pretty decent match. Maybe not perfect, but decent. And so let's see what happens when we blend colors. Like if we want to make a shadow color for FV2, I put down some of the B99 and then continued the FV2 and that works pretty decently. But the problem with this whole thing is that there's no color on the other side of FV2 that's like a go-to perfect color to blend with. Everything else dies. So when the BV1 family came out from Olo, I went, oh my gosh, that's gonna be perfect. And you can put the FV2 sandwiched in between the BV1.7 uh, and the BV1.4, and it just performs a beautiful transition. And then jump over to 1.2 and 1.1, and now you've got a whole string of a natural blending group. Natural blending groups, like I talked about in my last video, if you haven't seen that, go watch it. If you're an Olo user, especially a natural blending group has the first digit the same and the letters the same. And then the third digit is the one that gives you the value difference. Now let's take a look real quick at that blue green color we saw on the chart a few minutes ago. The Olo one on the right is more bluish. So play around with a couple different blues. And in this case, I found that a B18, just very simply layered over top of this, makes a really nice pairing between those. So I can make that blue green work better. 
Now, I also have this chart that I'm working on. You can see it's kind of in progress. There's some holes missing, some things that aren't working quite right. The labels on top are wrong. They're backwards because I printed out the wrong page. Anyway, the way that you can blend and and change colors and make those compensations with pencil is much easier than with your alcohol markers because pencils will just blend and blend and blend and they don't start lifting the colors from underneath the way alcohol markers do. So you just layer on top. Now the left hand side I picked an orange pencil from Polychromos and I'm going to see if I can take a random red and a random yellow and try to make that orange from a, poly, uh, from a Prismacolor set. And so I'm just going to keep layering them until I'm happy with what I see visually in front of me on the piece of paper. Now, if you're not going to use any blending solution, that is the perfect way to try to test your matches. Do they look right? Do they look like they match? Sure. But the way to really see if it's going to match, if you're going to use blending solution, is to make some swatches to test with blending solution. So I'm dipping a clean cotton ball into my blending solution, and I'm going to run it over top of the color that's the one I'm trying to match, flip the cotton ball around so I'm not using the same spot and dip it so that I can test my mixed color and look how much yellower the mixed one is. Now it might be close enough for whatever project I might mix that color for, but if it's too yellow, then I need to know what it should look like when it's dry so that when I start applying the blending solution that I end up with the color that I'm expecting at the end. And if you do any experiments like this, keep a notebook or a folder or something to put them in. Write down what you did so that you don't have to redo tests like this over and over again. And you can just pull that out and reference it. Now we're at the point where I'm going to share the silliness. If you're drinking coffee or anything, do not snort any out of your nose. I will not be held responsible. There used to be, and still is of course, an imaginary creatures class in colored pencil. But there is now one in alcohol markers, and I approached it a little differently this time. I asked for suggestions on subject matter. I just provided those little cards with colors on them and said, what should I draw for the class? And I wrote them all on a piece of paper and kept dropping a pink arrow so that I could figure out what two things to pair together for each lesson. And so there's 10 lessons in this class that are crazy. Things that do not belong together. But they were fun to draw and I think they'll be inspiring to you to help you think outside the box. Now I am drawing without a net here when I'm doing mine, but I am going to be providing for you very pale pencil type sketches. Like so you can get the first gist of the color in alcohol marker. And then wherever your alcohol markers land is where you'll make your marks with your pen. So you're basically, basically going to trace what you've colored from my drawing, or you can just go without a net if you want. That's entirely fine too. I'll, I'll show you how I drew it and how I thought through the shapes so that you could follow along that way if you want. Entirely up to you. What I've also done is all the lessons are done larger than they were for the color pencil one because alcohol marker you can't get into all those little details very easily like you can with color pencil and I'm also doing them on a separate piece of paper so I can cut them out and stick them in all the little frames so there is my Fischenstein monster also known as uh, Frankenfish I'm not sure which is the better name for him but each of the other ones in class came out so funny and so cute and you might be wondering what the words were that got chosen for each one of these. I'll show you that in a minute. But they came out really fun. I tried to come up with different interesting techniques, uh, especially for new-ish colorists. This is a level two class, so it's not going to be super difficult stuff at all. And they're really fun, as you can tell. So the first one, we have the Skeptic Owl. I tried to come up with funny names for them. He looks a little on the skeptical side. The uh, Girelephant, giraffe with elephant ears, because I wanted to, you know, figure out how to put an elephant and a giraffe together. Uh, rock Lobster. I don't know who put rock on the list, but thank you for that, because the Rock Lobster was hilarious. And then the, a teacup ended up on the list, so we have a teacup with a sloth in it. 
and the sleepy shoebill, <laughs> shoebill stork with tennis shoelaces on the beak. So that is part one. So it, since we're doing these larger than we did for the one sheet with the colored pencil ones, then we're just going to do them larger so that you have more room. And that means page two, so we can still have 10 lessons. These are different animals, different creatures than were in the colored pencil one. So if you want to take both of them, you can do that and you'll get different animals, a uh, different approach to it a little bit in the colored pencil version, of course, as well. And I use some uh, score tape on the back of mine to stick them down on the page. So we have the dodo sheep, which I shall be counting when I try to fall asleep now. The moose stash, I have to admit, I couldn't get the arrow to land on mustache after landing on moose, so I cheated. Octo pussycat, because there were lots of cats and kittens on the list. And then we have the uh, prince of all the penguins. He's wearing a uniform with epaulettes and everything. And then the last one, we have the chroma 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 chameleon who is also a unicorn. So <laughs> such silliness. Oh my gosh. If you're interested in the class, the link is in the doobly do. And the first lesson and the pre-class lesson are both available. The others will become available in the next couple days because I got to get the voiceovers all finished. But I wanted you to have this for the weekend if you needed something creative over the long holiday in the U.S., and I will see you again next week with another medium than alcohol markers because I think all of the fumes are getting to my brain. I am singing, I am dancing, I am drawing weird things. So I think we need like pencils or paints. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.